Hello and welcome to a new video presented by Telescope Service. My name is Thorsten and in this video I want to cover another topic of our theory series. And it is a question that we got asked very often and it is what telescope mount should I choose? More specifically what principal type of telescope mount? There are two different versions available. The first one is the azimuthal mount which you can see here just as an example and also equatorial mounts. And I will try to explain you the differences between these two mounts to help you to decide what you should choose when starting astronomical observations. So I will not cover very specific models here, to, or nor do a comparison or something like that. I will use these two mounts just as an example. The principles are working exactly the same way also for different brands, different uh, manufacturers, you know. So let's get started with the first type of mount, which are the azimuthal mounts. Here's an example, we have a Skywatcher AZ GTIX, but to be honest, I can also use a photo tripod to show you the principle, because it's working in the same way. With such a mount, we have two axes. The first one is the azimuth axis, which defines the rotation of your camera or your lens. And the second one is the altitude axis, which defines the height of the telescope or lens. With these two axes, you can point to any object in the sky or any terrestrial object pretty, yeah, let's say intuitive, because you're just pointing to it as you're, maybe you are familiar with pointing on a photo tripod, so that's working in exactly the same way. Now you may ask, why not just use a photo tripod? Well, the first reason is normally photo tripods are very limited in the load that they can handle until this ball will just lose its friction. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, it's very difficult to point to the zenith, with, especially with a ball head. That's nearly impossible. There's only mostly one place where you can put the ball head into that position. Uh, otherwise, it will also stuck on the on the tripod. So that's the reason why there are dedicated astronomical mounts. They have moved the telescope just on the side. So when you point to the zenith, you will not hit your tripod normally if the telescope is short enough. Otherwise, there are also extensions available that you can put under that mount head to bring the telescope even higher and provide more space. So for terrestrial observations, this approach is great with moving these two axes and just pointing the telescope somewhere. This is pretty straightforward and as said, very intuitive. For celestial observations, you have the problem that you have to follow the object from east over the south, the meridian to the west, where it will then go below the horizon. So you have always to move two axes to follow that object. It is normally not a big problem. For example, all the Dobsonian telescopes work in that way. But it is a bit difficult, to be honest. So that's one downside of this uh, mounting type. And the second one is when you want to do photography, may it be with a saddled camera, a piggyback camera, or through the telescope, then you will see an effect that's called field rotation. So the objects are appearing to rotate in your telescope frame, in your field of view, and that will draw the images unusable, especially if you're exposing long time. For deep sky photography, you have to expose multiple seconds up to minutes. That will always bring some little arcs in the corners, and that's not what you want to achieve. But as said, for visual observation or very short exposure times, one second, maybe two seconds, that's a great approach and it's super easy to set up and easy to use. If you decide to do only visual observing, then you can also decide for a bit more advanced mount like this one here. This has motors integrated, two motors, to follow that movement automatically. So you don't have to care of any of the tracking here the mount just does it for you. What you have to do is you have to initialize it on a specific point and then 
it can also achieve a go-to functionality. That means you can use a smartphone app, which is a modern approach to use a telescope. One more word on that field rotation. Uh, I prepared a video. I settled a camera here on that azimuthal mount and just used it for tracking, tracking the stars so that I can do also a visual observing here. And what you see is that the horizon stays very level as expected because we are moving only this axis here. But the stars, when you look at the corners, you see the stars are, appear to rotate in the field. And that's what I meant with this field rotation. Here in that wide angle shot, it just looks some sort of cool, but in a deep sky photography shot, you don't want to have this effect. Okay, now let's talk about the second option that you have, the equatorial mount. In principle, we have again two axes, this one and this one, but they are tilted, as you see. They are not pointing straight upward, but they are tilted in a specific angle. And that angle is the same as your geographic latitude. And the effect of this is, you can point this axis to the celestial pole. And when doing this, you can follow the rotation of the Earth by just rotating this axis here. So it is super simple to follow celestial objects in the sky, because only one axis needs to be moved. For terrestrial observing, this approach is pretty awkward because you have then to point your telescope something like that and have to move two axes to point it along the horizon for example. This is pretty difficult and not really recommended. So the most important effect of that type of mount is that this field rotation will not appear. So when mounting a telescope like this and you do this polar alignment pretty precise up to an, some arc minutes or less, then there will be virtually no field rotation. And that is your entry into deep sky photography. With that approach, you can expose multiple seconds, minutes without an issue. When talking about photography, I want to mention the different levels features of these mounts. So the very most simple mounts come without any electronics. That means completely manual, as also possible with these azimuthal mounts. You then just have two knobs that you have to rotate and with these you can follow the movement and also find a line the, the position of the telescope. The more advanced versions have motors in right ascension and maybe also in declination. And then you have a hand pad to your mount so you don't have to touch the mount when tracking. It's just moving by itself and for fine alignment you can use buttons on the hand pad. Very simple to use, they are better repowered and also good to, good to go if you are mobile. Yeah, the most advanced version uses go-to functionality. That means you align the telescope on one known object, for example a star or a planet or something, and then the telescope calculates other positions. That means then you can automatically go to any object in the sky that is noted in the handpad or in your planetarium software. It is then super simple. So, for example, you have a handpad like this. This is here from Skywatcher, as said, but uh, the other brands use similar approaches, maybe with graphic display or something. Uh, then this is also up to you to decide what you prefer. Maybe you have a specific brand, what you like, but in principle they work all in the same manner and nearly the same functionality. Okay, these were the most important informations that I want to tell you about these types of mounts. Um, but now some more words on things you should consider when choosing a mount. So the first thing was the family. May it be azimuthal or equatorial, that's the first decision you have to make. But then you should also keep an eye out on some parameters. I already mentioned the electronics, so you have to decide should it be just a manual one or do you want to have the full go-to functionality. Nowadays I would recommend go-to, but the learning effect is pretty low with go-to functionality because yeah, you just don't remember objects 
when, when they are driven automatically. If you have to look for them with the finder scope and then also looking around through the telescope to find an object, that's a bit more interesting. Especially if you are a beginner, I would recommend not only rely on GoTo, but also just remember some positions of important and bright objects in the sky. So, one of the most important things with mounts is the load capacity. That's a value that's always stated when looking for a mount in, in the shop or somewhere. The load capacity is the value that the manufacturer states the amount of weight that can drive the mount without problems within its specifications. So that's very, very rough description of this value. And this is not a fixed hard value. So um, we are not talking about breaking the mount or damaging something if you load a bigger, a heavier scope onto it, but the precision may degrade. And for example, the motors may not be able to drive the telescope anymore, especially if it's not balanced properly then that may be an issue. This value is often uh, used with some tolerance and some room, but I would consider not stretching it to the limit. So, for example, if you have a setup or plan to use a setup with, let's say, 10 kilograms, I would recommend a mount with a load capacity not under 15 kilograms, for example. Something like that, just to have an idea. If you use it to the limit, it is still working, of course, but then it's maybe a bit shaky. That means if you, if you hit the telescope accidentally or it's windy, then it may just shake and that's not what you want. You want to have it rigid and stable and be point on. So, but stability comes, of course, with a drawback and that's the second point I want to mention and that's the, the weight of the mount itself. Especially when you are doing mobile astrophotography, for example, or mobile astronomy, then the weight of the mount may be an issue for you. Maybe you have to carry it a long way downstairs or wherever. Um, you should be aware of the mount. You know, we are not talking only about the head, but also the counterweights uh, are important and of course the tripod. And maybe you have also a power bank or a battery box or something that you have to carry. All that sums up uh, to a plenty of kilogram of, of weight that you have to carry around. Regarding that weight, I can also recommend the very new harmonic drive mounts. They're also available from different manufacturers. You can check them out also in the shop. They can carry a pretty high amount of load without the counterweight and be still very stable and also very lightweight. So that may be a good approach if you're using mobile, uh, a mobile setup. And that's also an important thing uh, that comes with the electronics. When doing deep sky photography, you normally have to auto guide your mount. That means you have to correct for issues in the warm drive and also in the setup, in the polar alignment, which can be corrected in some way with a guide scope or of access guider, so with auto guiding. And therefore the mount has to be compatible with either ST4 interface or it has a serial interface. ST4 is that RJ11 plug that's normally integrated in the mount. And a serial interface, for example here with Skywatcher, they have a USB interface which is super straightforward, connectable to, to a PC. And then you can use a guide software like PHD2 or MaxMDL or whatever you prefer to do this auto guiding. That will improve your photos pretty much. And this helps you also with the polar alignment. Okay, that's all that I want to cover here in that video. There are also a bit more advanced topics like encoders, tracking precision, uh, polar alignment was one thing, but I think they, these topics are a bit too advanced for that entry level and introductionary video. If you have specific questions, of course, feel free to drop a comment below the video. I will try to answer them. But uh, so far, thank you very much for viewing and I hope you see you next time. Thanks. Bye bye.